great song, isn't it? You know, Christians are not exempt from the sufferings and the trials of life. And I hope when you listen to that song and you sing it, you let it dwell in your heart richly. That when you do go through your sufferings and your trials, your temptations, that you have a hope you can be focused on that will cause you and allow you to look above the suffering and be motivated to continue on toward that hope. And what a wonderful thing that is, to be Christians and to be set apart in this world and have that living hope that Jesus has made possible for us. Thank you, Ethan, for leading us in that song. Appreciate that very much. Open your Bibles with me, please, to Luke chapter 5, where we were just a little bit earlier. Well, thank you all for being here this evening. Appreciate the presence of each and every one. If you're visiting with us, we are very thankful to have you in our midst. We want you to come back and be with us anytime we have the opportunity. If you have any questions for us, please ask those questions. We'll be glad to do our best to give you a Bible answer and try to point you to those things which are above. Two weeks ago, I brought you a lesson from Luke chapter 7. And that's the parable of the two debtors there as... We were talking about Jesus and his interaction with Simon the Pharisee. That's a, that's a parable that I thought about a lot that Jesus gives in his dealings with Simon. And as I thought more about that, as I was going through the week, that two weeks ago, I thought, you know what, I'd really like to just take some lessons from the Gospel of Luke. I really didn't have any order that I wanted to go in. So today I'm going backwards to the fifth chapter. And we're going to look at... Uh, an event in the life of Jesus that Seth's already read for us, but we're going to go back and we're going to examine that. And what we're going to find is that in this event in Jesus' life, as he deals with, with the things that are going on, what we can do is we can make some application to ourselves and, and we can find who, who we ought to be in regard to others. We can come to understand and better know who Jesus is and we can come to understand how we can better deal with others in our lives who try to hinder us in keeping our focus upon Jesus. So let's do that as we examine verses 17 through 26 from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And what I want us to do is, is just think of this as some realizations of the lame man. You have a man here, obviously, from the reading we've already heard, uh, that is a paralytic. And he's been brought to Jesus. But it can be necessarily implied that there are some things, obviously, that this man has realized. His realizations are very powerful. And the applications can be made to ourselves and some realizations that we need to be aware of also. First of all, I would like for us to see that this lame man realized, obviously, that he had true friends. Why do I say that? Uh, because... This man's friends brought him to Jesus. Let's read it again in the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Do you see that picture? I, here are these men. Obviously friends of this paralytic, right? And they are concerned about this man so much so that they're going to pick him up on his bed and carry him to where Jesus is. They've obviously all heard about Jesus. And they've obviously all understood who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. And they just know they've got to get their man, this man, this friend to Jesus. Why? Because they've recognized the seriousness of his situation. This man's paralyzed. He's been this way obviously for a long time, maybe since birth. I don't know that for a fact. But they understand how serious this man's situation is. And can you imagine that in the first century that a paralytic doesn't have a lot of hope? I would say even today that a person who's paralyzed is more prone to other health problems just because of his present condition. And could you imagine being in the first century, being a paralytic? 
I would say that the life expectancy of a paralytic probably wasn't very long. Because he's probably going to be riddled with other health issues because of the situation that he's in. And they look at this, their friend, and they realize how serious his condition is. And they say to themselves, we have got to get this guy to Jesus. Why? Well, because they understood that he could not get well on his own. They realize there is no way that he's going to become well on his own. There's obviously no medical procedures of the day that can take away his paralysis. So they understand that there's a need here. They recognize the seriousness of the situation and they recognize the fact that only Jesus can heal this man. And because they understand who Jesus is and the power that Jesus has, they've obviously come to be assured of that that they know they have to get him to Jesus. There's no other way. We understand the seriousness of his situation. We know he cannot be healed in any other way. We must get this man to Jesus. Only Jesus can heal him. And therefore, they recognize the urgency of the situation, don't they? May I say this? If these men would have just been friendly acquaintances of this guy, when they got to the house where Jesus was, they'd say, well, you know what? Well, we tried, you know. Maybe if they were just friendly acquaintances, they would have gone that far. But certainly if they get to a house where people are just pouring out of, and they want to get this guy to see Jesus, and they're just saying, you know, we can't get him in there. Sorry, buddy, maybe next time. No. They recognize that this may be the only chance that this man gets to be in the presence of Jesus and has the opportunity to be healed. And we're not going to miss the opportunity. So in understanding that, they get themselves, and not just themselves, this paralytic up to the rooftop. Now, maybe they had some stairs to take them up there. Maybe they had a ladder to climb. I don't know, but I'll tell you what, it wasn't easy. I don't know how many people here have tried to carry a grown person in a blanket walking on flat ground. But how many of you have tried to carry one up the stairs or maybe up a ladder and get them on a housetop in a timely manner to make sure you get them there before Jesus leaves? But they were going to do whatever they could do. Why? Because they were friends, true friends of this man. They recognized the seriousness of, it, seriousness of his situation. They recognized that he could not heal himself and he could not be healed on his own. They recognized that Jesus could heal him and therefore they recognized the urgency of the situation and all of these things proved to us that the friends that this man had were true friends. Here's the second thing I'd like for us to notice that this lame man obviously came to realize that he had a Savior who cared. Why do I say that? Because when this man appears in the midst of Jesus, Jesus emphasizes the spiritual over the physical. Before we go any farther, let me say this. It's amazing to me that Jesus <laughs> addresses this in the way that he does. Public teachers do not like to be distracted. Have you learned that from Andrew and myself? What happens when the lights go out <laughs> and we're speaking? Oh, we're all distracted, aren't we? Somebody get the lights turned back on. What about when things uncontrollably beep in our presence? What do Andrew and I do? <laughs> we get all distracted, don't we? We want it to stop. Because public teachers, they, we don't like distractions. We, we like to keep the attention of our audience to try to get across the spiritual truths that we're trying to get people to see and to understand. But Jesus embraces the distraction, doesn't he? Can you see that? Uh, can you see the roof opening up above you? And all of a sudden, this man being lowered down into our midst all eyes are going to go where? 
They're going up, aren't they? Nobody is going to be paying attention to the teacher anymore. But there's something different about Jesus. <laughs> there's a lot of things different about Jesus than Andrew and myself, right? But one glaring thing is that Jesus could work miracles when he was on earth, and Andrew and I can't do that. Nor can any other public teacher. And what Jesus does is he takes advantage of the distraction to prove who he is and what he has the power to do. We'll come back to that. But notice in verse 20 that Jesus proves that he truly cares by what his emphasis is in verse 20. When this man comes down in his midst and in the midst of everyone else, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. That was the first words out of Jesus' mouth. What would, the, what would be out of my mouth if that happened? What in the world is going on here? Who let these people on the roof? And why in the world are they lowering him down in the midst of these people? But it's obvious from the reaction of Jesus to the distraction that he cares more about the spiritual than he does the physical. Man, your sins are forgiven you. Can you see that? You see, what Jesus realized is that paralysis only has to do with this life. But sin has to do with eternity. You know, Jesus could have very well healed this man. And just taking this opportunity to show that he had the power to heal and prove the point. Let all of you see that I can make this man well. But Jesus made the point that spiritual things were more important than physical things. And he's going to make an even greater point that we'll get to later. But Jesus didn't do that. The first words out of his mouth was, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Why? Because Jesus' focus was always on the spiritual over the physical. And because that was the way it was with Jesus. And because this was the emphasis in regard to the event that's going on with this man. We can see, and obviously this man came to realize that he had before him a Savior who truly cared. Now let's examine some other characters that were in the midst. And something else that this lame man obviously realized at the same time is that he had scoffers in his midst. Do you remember who else was there? Specifically pointed out in the text, there were some critics there. Look at verses 21 and 22. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? This house is packed full of people. And there are scribes and Pharisees in the midst. It wouldn't have been an everyday occurrence for the scribes and the Pharisees to be in some random house, sitting in the house with just any people. No, they were there because Jesus was there. And they were there to be critics of Jesus. They had heard about Jesus and they have come to see what in the world is going on and what all the talk is about. That's why they're there. And I believe Mark's account says that they were sitting in the house. I may be wrong about that. I'd have to go back. But it seems if they were sitting in the house, I would say there were a lot of people who were standing that they were sitting as a, in a, like a place of honor because of who they were, the scribes and the Pharisees. But these critics charged Jesus with blasphemy, saying that, well, only God can forgive sins. And let me stop here and say, at this point, they are absolutely right, aren't they? They're right. Yes. That's one thing they get right on this day. Only God can forgive sins. Can't you see them sitting there? All of this talk has been going on about Jesus. Everybody's talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Oh, how great Jesus is. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, are all, they're not liking this very much. And they're coming there to see, and it may be almost a snarl about Jesus. And Jesus says, man, your sins are forgiven you. Who does this man think he is? Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Only God can forgive sins. That's right. Now, Mark specifically says that these Scribes and Pharisees reasoned these things in their hearts. They said it to themselves. But Jesus makes it public knowledge, doesn't he? Jesus speaks it out. Why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Why was this man brought to Jesus? Because his friends knew that only Jesus could help him. There had obviously been a discussion before they left home. Friend, we're going to take you to see Jesus because Jesus can heal you. I would, I would imagine that this fellow on the bed had heard about Jesus too. And I'm going to imagine and say that all had hope on the way to the house that Jesus can heal them. But you've got scoffers in the midst who are trying to rob this man of his hope. They're trying to steal it away. They may have reasoned it in their hearts, but Jesus brought it to the attention of everyone. And that's no coincidence, is it? Jesus wanted them to know. These are saying that I am a blasphemer. And these are saying only God can forgive sins. And they have to be thinking in the moment. You know how it is when scoffers mock. If you put your hope and your assurance in something, and you have, you have this anticipation of it, and you're, you're longing for it to happen, and people come along, and they scoff at your hope. And they try to steal away this confidence that you have. What does that do to you? That takes the wind out of your sails a little bit, doesn't it? That's what scoffers do. And that's what they're trying to do on this occasion. They don't want Jesus to be this man. Not the man that he's been built up to be. They don't want Jesus to have any more prestige than what they have. Who is this man? Lame man hears it too. However, Jesus proves that he has the power to forgive sins, doesn't he? Look at verse 23. Jesus asked them why were they raising these things in their hearts. Then he says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven to you or to say rise up and walk? But you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. I believe Mark's account says, We have seen amazing things today. And I would say so, right? So what does Jesus do? He, first of all, proves the point that he was going to make all along. I have the power to. But which is, it, which is easier? To say, your sins are forgiven you? Wouldn't that be easier? Now can't you see the scribes and the Pharisees at this moment? Here they've come to find some proof about how great this man is. And they want to see the evidence. And now, hear the first words out of his mouth where your sins are forgiven you? Something that can't be seen? And they're scoffing, aren't they? Oh, we knew he would do something like that. Something no one can see anyway. But Jesus says, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven you? Sure, that's easier. Or to say, get up, you paralyzed man, and walk to your house. But to show you that I do have the power to forgive sins. Hey, bud. 
Get up and take up your bed and just go on home. And he did. And what did Jesus do, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, he proved that he had the power to forgive sins, didn't he? But the overall more powerful point is, is that Jesus proved, hey guys, I'm not a blasphemer. I am God. Because only God has the power to forgive sins. So Jesus has already just assured them of the fact of something that they've already said themselves. And yes, this man had true friends. True friends that wanted to bring their friend to Jesus. And when they brought their friend to Jesus, they come to find out that they were in the midst of a Savior who truly cared. But they also obviously realized that they had scoffers in their midst. But even though they had scoffers in their midst, Jesus took the time and he took advantage of a moment to prove to this man and to everyone else that he truly had the power to forgive sins and they can place their confidence and their assurance in him. He had true friends. He had a Savior that cared. Had scoffers in his midst, but Jesus took all of the doubt out of the way. Now, with that understanding of this occasion, let's take that and turn it to ourselves, making spiritual application. And let's talk about some things that we should realize. One thing that we should realize is that our friends should have true friends in us. What type of friends are we? Let's ask ourselves some questions. Do we realize the serious condition of a lost person? Do we understand and know that those friends that we have who are outside of Christ and or family members who are outside of Christ, do we realize the seriousness of their lost condition? Do we understand and know that if they lose their life today, that they're going to be separated from God for an eternity for the wages of sin or death, spiritual death. Do we recognize how serious that is? Do we realize that these people cannot save themselves on their own? There's nothing they can do to rid themselves of the sin that separates them from God. And do we recognize and realize that only Jesus can heal them? Jesus said, I am the way, the only way. I am the truth, the only truth. I am the life. Jesus is the only way. He gives you the only guidance and instruction that will lead you to eternal life. Do we realize that those lost people that we say we love and we're concerned about, do we realize the urgency of their situation? Jesus said himself, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Do we realize how urgent that is? That we all know people, and I am speaking to myself at the same time, we all know people we see day in and day out who are lost people, separated from God. But we talk to them about politics and ball games and the Super Bowl and who knows what else. And we always seem to bypass speaking to them about the seriousness of their lost condition. And I ask myself and I charge you or challenge you to ask yourself, do our friends have true friends in you and I? Maybe we need a little motivation and a little reminder. To remind ourselves that we still have a Savior who can. Do we still realize that? That Jesus is still our Savior and Jesus still cares. But we, like Jesus, we too must understand the importance of the spiritual over the physical. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. But our light for fiction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Therefore, we do not look to things which are seen, 
but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We've got to have that viewpoint, you see. We've got to have that focus. If we're going to, to keep ourselves where we need to be, and if we're going to help others find Jesus and maintain a relationship with Jesus, we've got to have that emphasis that the spiritual always overrides the physical. And not let things get in the way to hinder that. We've got to come to that realization. We all know someone who is struggling physically but lost spiritually. We all know someone. I just, I spoke to a brother recently about a situation like this. As a family member that has cancer outside of Christ. I tell you what, it was an emotional situation to have to talk with him. You know how emotional it is to talk to a family member, a lost family member about their condition? But you know what? He's got cancer. He's got this extreme form of stomach cancer, and days might be numbered. He may not have much time left to talk with him about it. You know what he did? He prayed about it, and, and he went to see him, and he talked to him about it. Why? Oh, he could have sat and talked to him about the treatment that's coming up and, and about what he's going to do and the hospital that he's going to be in, about how long the recovery period is going to take of the first procedure. And he could have talked about that and only talked about that. But you know what he made up his mind to do? Talk to him about his soul. Because he understood that the spiritual was much more important than the physical. We're all going to leave this life. But where we spend our eternity is the most important thing. We too have to have that understanding. Physical things only have to do with this life. You see, sin has to do with eternity. In the 13th chapter of the book of Luke, I won't ask you to go there for the sake of time, but you have people who have come to Jesus and are trying to categorize sins. They're speaking of some who, whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. They're talking about, oh, how great a sinners those Galileans must have been. And there were some of whom the Tower of Siloam had fell upon. And they talked about, oh, how great a sinners they must have been. Jesus says, no, let me tell you something. What makes you think they're much greater sinners than you are? But if you don't repent, Jesus said, you too will likewise perish. Sin is sin, and sin separates man from God. And one can't find himself in a position to where he has that promise and that hope of eternal salvation if he's never found forgiveness of his sins. Who do you know right now who you see on a daily basis, maybe a weekly basis, but you see them a lot? They may have struggles. They may have physical ailments. You may talk to them about that. But you know they're lost as well. And how often do we take the time to talk to them about their souls? It isn't easy, is it? It's one of the most awkward things you can do sometimes. But that's what Christianity is. It's getting yourself outside of your comfort zone and talking and dealing with those issues that are most important. Well, why should we do that? Because we still have a Savior that cares. And finally, Let's be aware of this. Many today scoff at salvation in Christ, don't they? I mean, you may go somewhere and you may talk to someone about Jesus and you may be very passionate about it, and I hope you are. You should be. But someone may overhear you speaking to someone about Jesus and the salvation that's found in Him and how they need to access God's grace by faith. Someone may overhear that and say, oh, that's just a bunch of junk. Jesus? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that there are going to be those who do just that. Peter says that scoffers would come in the last days, mocking, saying, where is this promise of his coming? All things continue the same as they were from the beginning. Peter says there's going to be people who do that. And there are, aren't they? 
Sometimes very, very intelligent people. And they use the media as their springboard. And uh, they put on these, these documentaries. And, uh, but you know what? Jesus dealt with that in his day. The scribes and the Pharisees sat among the people on that day as the most intelligent in the room. But they were wrong when it came to Jesus, except for the aspect of who he really was. And they didn't even know they were wrong. However, though people are going to scoff, Jesus still has the power to forgive sins. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'm not going to ask you to turn there either. But after Samuel's dealing with Saul, he talked about God, that he does not relent once he has purposed something in his mind. That once God purposes something to be done, He doesn't change His mind. He's not like a man in who changes His mind. That's not God. You see, there are certain things that God cannot do. You may be thinking, well, Jason, how can you say something like that? I can say it because Scripture says it. I know there's some things that God can't do because the Bible says so. God cannot fellowship sin. God cannot lie. We could come up with several of those things, couldn't we? But here's you another. God does not change. The Bible says that, doesn't it? Hebrews 13 and verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus is God. We've already proved that point. Therefore, even though there are scoffers in the world today that may scoff at us trying to lead people to the Lord, let them scoff and let them mock at that. Because Jesus still has the power to forgive sins. How do you know that? Because of what we've already studied. Luke chapter 5 verses 17 through 26 was written for our learning so that we may believe. Turn with me to one more passage. John chapter 20. Beginning in verse 31. John chapter 20. Verse 30 beginning, please. Notice what John writes. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Why did we just study Luke 5, 17 through 26? Because that account was written for you and me. So we could go back to that and we could see, you know what? No one has to drop through the roof tonight a paralytic, and someone come up and heal him. You know why? Because Jesus has already done that 2,000 years ago. And in Jesus doing that 2,000 years ago and confirming who he was then still confirms for us now that Jesus is God and Jesus still has the power to take away sins. John said these things are written. Why? So we can have sufficient evidence to know that if today, if your sins are separated you from God and you believe that Jesus is the one who can take them away, you can still know today, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that Jesus has the power to forgive your sins. Why? Because it's been written. And the most powerful thing is what we can hold in our hands. And that is... As Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's what? It's the power of God to salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to Greek. It's the what? It's the power. When you read the scriptures, you learn of the power of Jesus. You learned that tonight, didn't you? You learned of the power of Jesus to forgive sins. Why does Jesus have the power to forgive sins? Because Jesus is God. And 
those things have been written to give us confidence and assurance in the fact that even though 2,000 years have passed, and even though today people still sit and scoff at salvation in Jesus Christ, we still have proof beyond the shadow of a doubt that we have salvation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope tonight that we've remembered the importance of being a true friend. <coughs> true friends lead their friends to Jesus. They go out of their way to do so. They lead them to Jesus because Jesus is a Savior who cares. And even though this world may try to hinder us and try to steal away our hope in Him, you can sit down and open up this Bible with them and you can give them all the confidence, assurance, and evidence that they need to have their sins forgiven in Him too. I hope I've encouraged you to do that and encouraged myself to do that also. Thank you so much for your good attention tonight. There may be someone here tonight who's outside of Christ and without a hope. But if you are, we want to appeal to you tonight to find salvation in Jesus Christ. Why wait? Do you see the urgency of your situation? If you're sitting in this room tonight and you have any doubt whatsoever about your salvation in Jesus Christ, why are you waiting? There is nothing more important than that. You know, when your gas tank gets down to that letter E, do you keep driving thinking, well, you know what, I think I might make it? Or do you stop at the gas station and put gas in your tank? You do, don't you? Let me tell you something. Why are we wondering if we're going to make it on our own if we've come to the realization that we're not? I'm appealing to you tonight. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and forgiveness of sins are found in Him, please come tonight. Repenting of your sins and be baptized in His name, the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you can have that salvation. And we want to help you. If we can do anything to help anyone tonight, please come while we stand and while we sing.